Hello, and welcome to the Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, as we continue to make our way towards Christmas, right, in Advent, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the desert and um, how the Lord leads his people into the desert in order to create a garden there. Um, where he can meet with his beloved. And I actually had a different podcast planned in my heart, um, but this really struck me at Mass last night or two nights ago, and I felt like the Lord wanted me, especially in light of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Was that last night? Or it was Friday night that I, I um, went to the Vigil Mass for Our Lady of Guadalupe. And as I was reflecting on the gifts that Our Lady of Guadalupe gave us this weekend, um, and you will see this a week later, right? I realized how providential it is in the church that this feast day comes in Advent, right? Which she is the pregnant mother that comes, right? When you study her, um, her dress, it's an um, Aztec uh, maternity dress that she's wearing. She has like a sash and, and some signs on her dress that the Indians would have um, on the clothing of a woman who was expecting a child. So it's really beautiful um, when you start to think and contemplate what gift she gave us um, in Guadalupe on that mountain of Tepeyac and how that corresponds to what the Lord's doing liturgically and in our hearts, especially through Isaiah and, um, and as I prayed, I started to really meditate again on the Song of Songs. So I have a whole lot of things I wanted to pull together, and um, I hesitated recording it today because some of it's not printed out. It's on my computer, but um, it's on my heart to just try to record this. So I hope you don't mind that I'll look at my computer a little bit. But at the very beginning, um, we are going to start with a song that I learned in Russia in 1994. This little paper in my hand is from 1994, way before I ever um, spoke Russian or played guitar. <laughs> and um, it's called Boja Tibia Ishu, which means, Lord, I search for you. And the words at the beginning is a land like a desert without water, a land all dried up without you. Right? That's like what our hearts are. And Lord, I'm looking for you, you know, everywhere because um, I'm searching for you because I'm in this wilderness, right? Um, and it just says, Lord, I'm searching for you. Lord, I'm searching for you. That's just the first verse. But I'm going to sing that. Um, and it's all about, you know, my soul is thirsting. It's going to die of thirst because I don't have you, Lord, I'm looking for you, I've lost you, right? Um, it's just a very simple song, Boja Tibia Ishu. But I thought that would be a beautiful one to start with. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's try that again. Zimlia Pustina Ipies Vodnia Zimlia Is Hochla Pies Tibia Gaspo Ishu Tibia Thank you. 
The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of the Desert, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I am surrounded by Our Lady of Guadalupe with Juan Diego, right? And we all know that story of him and how... Um, Roses were given to him in the winter on the mountain of Tepeyac in the desert, right? Roses didn't grow there, especially in the winter. And then I have um, this beautiful icon of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. And I have the infant heart, the Maria Bambina. And around her, I have the desert rose trees. I don't know if you can see the I hope so. But it's the idea of the tree that um, grows in the desert and it grows to be 10 feet tall and it's got a huge trunk and um, it's years and years of just like an ugly stump and then these beautiful flowers come and you can't destroy them. They're indestructible. And that's kind of a symbol of our hearts, how when we're called into the desert by the Lord. We're supposed to develop really deep root systems and build up this reserve so that when we need him, we can bear fruit no matter what comes. And then one of my most favorite icons that I've ever made is Our Lady of the Desert here. And she is standing on a cactus, a flowering cactus, and she has the infant crucified Christ in her arms. And she's giving him to us. So there are several things I kind of want to go through here, but it is, like I said at the beginning, just the idea of how the Lord draws us into a desert. You know, we're, we heard John the Baptist again this Sunday. You know, I'm a voice of one crying out in the desert. He draws us into the desert, not for the sake of the desert, but to make room so he can make it 
bloom forth as a beautiful garden where he can come and have that time, that intimacy alone with us in our hearts, right? The desert is a beautiful place. Um, I've been so blessed to spend years in several different deserts, right? And, you know, the African desert is different than the Texan desert, which is different than the Spanish desert, you know? And in some ways, where I worked in Siberia, it was tundra, right? But um, it can remind you of like that empty, arid area of like the desert, because spiritually, that's where, that's what it was. You know, there's the Arizona desert, which is different. Um, but the Lord calls us into a desert so that he can make water come forth from a rock, right? So that he can provide for us. In Isaiah 51, what does it say? Yes, the Lord shall comfort Zion. The Lord shall comfort all of her ruins, all of those desert places. Her wilderness he shall make like Eden, her wasteland like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found in her and thanksgiving in the sound of song. So it's really interesting. At the beginning of the creation of the world, God didn't make a desert for people. He made the garden of Eden. He provided everything they needed there. But Adam and Eve sinned. And it not only had... Um, an effect on their soul and their relationship with God and their relationship with each other. But it had negative effects in nature, right? That's why, you know, things die and, and um, you know, you have bad smells and, you know, sickness and all sorts of things. That's a disordered creation. And that's the result of man's sin, to be quite honest. So, there we see how the Garden of Eden was turned into like a putrid place. And then Adam and Eve were cast out of that garden. And, um, you know, they were cast out to wander the earth. And there was an angel put at the door so that nobody would re-enter there, right? Why did God lead them away from the garden into the desert? Because he wanted to really speak to their hearts. You know, when a child is in trouble, it's very important when you correct them that they, you have an atmosphere of silence, that you're down on their level, that they're looking at you in the eye, that you're connected, right? No distractions. And, you know, if a child does something wrong, you can yell and scream, what are you doing? Da, 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 and that's not going to do anything. Or you can stop. And if the whole room stops and it's quiet, suddenly the child's listening. And you get down and you say very quietly, that was not very nice. Apologize to your sister. And it actually makes a bigger impact on them, right? Because of that atmosphere. That's what God was doing with Adam and Eve. <laughs> he was pulling them into that silence, into the silent, the barrenness, so that he could speak to their hearts. In Hosea, what does it say? I will lead her into the desert to speak to her heart, right? And that's why... It's important that God leads his people away, away from the cities and the noise and the lush life to an atmosphere where they really can hear his voice echoing, right? But it's not so that they suffer. It's so that he can give them, say, a garden more beautiful than something they can have in a city, right? What he does is he pulls them into the desert to speak to their hearts, to form a garden for them, a place where they could meet. And then like we see the second, the first garden is the Garden of Eden and they mess it up and they have to leave. But later on in scripture, we have another garden. It's the Song of Songs, right? I've come to my garden, my bride. And I'll read that passage here in a minute. And he does that so that he can find love with us. So he pulls us away to purify and clean us, right? So what happened when the Israelites were walking around the desert all those years? They weren't trusting God. They weren't obeying. And so they had to take the long route, right? It took longer for God to scour out their hearts. If they had just listened and trusted in his love, it would have been real short. But God was patient. And he waited until they were all clean. And then he drew them to himself again, right? in the Song of Songs. 
And then we see another garden of Nazareth, a kitchen garden where Our Lady is praying. And an angel comes at noon and says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And the word becomes flesh within her in a garden. Then we see another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus chooses, you know, just like at the beginning of his ministry, he chose to go in the desert and be tempted for 40 days. Why? To conquer the desert, to conquer that barrenness. He went into the desert to fight Satan so that we in our deserts can have a garden. Then like after he like fought that battle and prepared the ground, he went out for three years and preached and healed and forgave sin. He was creating a garden, right? And then he enters Gethsemane, which was a beautiful garden. He had spent many, many nights in prayer there with his apostles and he entered it again. But this night, that garden got turned into a desert. His apostles fell asleep. They betrayed him. They abandoned him. He sweat blood. He cried, Father, if it can be your will, let this cup pass from me. And then he was taken to Calvary. And what does John, the Gospel of John say? In the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, right? And he died on that cross in a garden that was like a desert. And then after three days, the women and Mary Magdalene came to that garden and they met Jesus. Woman, why are you weeping? And she thought he was a gardener. And he was. He had died in a desert garden to make it a lush, beautiful, resurrected garden. And then after spending 40 days with them, he ascended into heaven and he said, stay here and pray for the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you will be sent into the world to do to the world what I did to you. Your hearts were desert places and I came from heaven and I saved you. And I turned this desert longing, Lord, I'm looking for you. I'm searching for a savior. This, this desert part of your heart, I turned it into a garden by entering in and suffering and toiling and loving you and then raising from the dead. And I gave you, I turned your desert into the garden. Now I'm sending you into the world, which is a big old desert. It's a wilderness. And I'm asking you to plant the church, make a garden, make a place where I can meet with my people again. I'm sending you apostles to go do what I did with you. Like in the Song of Songs where I met with you in a garden to share my love with you. And you are to share it with your children and the other people I bring to you. Deserts and gardens are so important this time of Advent, right? So in Isaiah, what did he say? You know, I, you know, Hosea, he says, I'll lead her into the desert and speak to her heart. So in Isaiah, it says, I'll comfort her ruins in the desert. Her wilderness, he will make like Eden. Eden became a wilderness and then he entered wilderness to make it like Eden, right? I'm sure in that first Christmas in Bethlehem in that cave, which was like a desert, Right? Dirty and empty and cold. Our Lady's love made it a garden, made it a beautiful place where she could meet with her infant bridegroom. Her wilderness he will make like Eden, her wasteland like the garden of the Lord. And in Isaiah 35, what does it say? The wilderness and the parched land will exult. The Araba will rejoice and bloom like the crocus. It shall bloom abundantly and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God. It's a promise again. 
that the Lord's going to call us into the desert to purify us during this Advent time, right? And just in the interior life in general, but not just to leave us hanging there. It's so that we can then unite with him and he can plant flowers of virtue, not vice. He doesn't, we don't want weeds in our heart. So he like clears everything away and makes it deserty. And then he speaks to us. So what does it say in Ephesians? That Christ loves his wife and washes her with his words, right? His words of love pour over and purify our hearts and make them real clean and then fill us up with those flowers of virtue and of grace, of union with him. In Ezekiel 34, the Lord also speaks about this. He says, I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. He said, you know, I'm going to pull you into the desert, but not so that you die, so that you'll live, so that you'll live, so you won't be suffocated by vice and the negative things in this world. He's asking us to enter the desert so he can make it a place of life. You know, when the Israelites were in the desert, they were hungry and he sent quail and manna. They were thirsty. And he struck a rock with a, with a staff, Moses did, at the Lord's instruction, and water came from a rock. How beautiful. That's what he does in our hearts. He lets us be hungry, and then he feeds us. He nurses us from his heart. He lets us thirst. And then he offers us his hard heart on the cross that's not hardened from sin. It's hardened from what we've done to him. It's dried up, thirsting for love. And he bursts it open with blood and water and pours it on us so that we're not thirsty. Psalm 107 says that God changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into a spring of water. He did that on Calvary. That's the Savior coming at Christmas. He wants us to make everything bare so that we can receive him in full. And, you know, it's interesting that Isaiah talks about, you know, the, um, the image of a bride and a bridegroom, right? Because um, in Isaiah, I think it's 61 where he says, you know, like a bridegroom bedecked with his clothes, like a bride ready for her, um, you know, her lover to come. Why? Because in the marital act, when a husband and wife come together, which is a symbol of God coming to a soul or coming to the church, they have to be naked and bare before each other, right? There's a vulnerability and a scariness in that. Will I be accepted? Will I really be loved? But if love is present, then it's more powerful, right? That nakedness makes the union more one. And that's how it is with Christ. He strips us during Advent of everything not of God so that he can come and join with us and be one with us at Christmas. And you know, this time of Advent of being stripped and prepared in the desert and then a garden being planted and receiving him at Christmas, we do this habitually every day or every week, depending how often you go to Mass. You know, at the beginning of the Mass, we do the penitential rite. God wants us to get rid of sin. Then he washes us with the Word. And then once we're stripped of the world, and we're stripped of ourselves, and we're stripped of, of vice, and we're dressed in his love from his Word, then he comes to intimately unite with us in the Eucharist. Not even just two bodies close to each other, but like in each other. We receive him into us, and he receives us into himself. In Isaiah 43, he says, Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. 
says, don't be afraid. Come with me into the desert. Come into some solitude, some seclusion. So I have all of your attention. And I will give you rivers. I will love you. And my love will make up for what you think you're lacking. What does he say in the gospel? Come away with me to a lonely place and rest a while. In Isaiah 43, he says, The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Drink to my chosen people. If he asks you to go into the desert with him, it's because you're chosen. It's because he trusts you and he wants to entrust something beautiful to you. In Jeremiah 31, he says, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when it went to find its rest. Grace was found in the wilderness. Grace. I had the readings from today, which next week it'll be like the Sunday previous. I, I believe it was Isaiah 61, where it talks about, um, you know, the Lord coming to heal the brokenhearted and to set the captives free, right? But then he said that, you know, I come, you know, dressed as a bridegroom for his bride. That's the action that he's doing in our lives in the desert by drawing us into a desert to make it bloom. That's why I love the contrast. I may love desert flowers more than actual roses. <laughs> There's such a mystery there. I used to love the blooming flowers in South Texas. I mean, I just loved them. And like, you couldn't cut them. They were like, you couldn't really bring them into your hermitage because there's so many thorns. Like if you went to try to like pick one of those desert flowers, like your hands were just full of stickers, you know, because they grow on these thorny, painful plants, but they're beautiful. That's what he's doing in our hearts. Our lives are not always easy. Our lives are not always painless. They're hard. We don't feel like we get what we need all the time. So it's like a desert. It's dried up. It's hot. There's beasts all around, but he makes our spiritual life bloom with beautiful, radiant flowers. How? Through his love, through speaking his words of love to us, right? What does he say in the Song of Songs? He speaks about our heart, right? In Song of Songs, chapter 4. You are an enclosed garden, my sister and my bride. An enclosed garden, a fountain sealed. You are a park that puts forth pomegranates with all choice fruits, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, all kinds of incense, myrrh and aloes with the finest spices. You are a garden fountain, a well of water flowing fresh from Lebanon. Look at that, all that life, all that, those fruits and the flowers and everything he said that's growing in the heart of his, of his beloved, who's in a desert. He's making her desert heart into a garden through his love, through Advent, through his grace. What does he say? Arise, north wind. Come, south wind. What are those winds of the Holy Spirit? Blow upon my garden, that its perfumes may spread abroad. Let my lover come to his garden and eat its choice fruits. It's a really beautiful reflection I read once in Maria Veltorta's poem of the Man God, where John is talking with Jesus about Our Lady and the Song of Songs, and how she is fulfilling this exact passage through the Incarnation. You know, she is saying to God, let my lover come to his garden. And he does. He comes into her womb. He comes into her heart. He comes into the center of her life, which is not thornless. We know the sorrows of Our Lady's heart. She has swords in that heart. But she still gives forth her desert flowers, right? Right? 
My lover has come to his garden, to the beds of spice, to browse in the garden and to gather lilies. My lover belongs to me and I to him as he browses among the lilies, says the Song of Songs. And it, the book opens with, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Draw me and I will follow. That kind of thirst for the love of God happens to us when he draws us into a garden. Our entire being thirsts for him to love us. And we ask him, we can't do anything. He has to draw us. He has to do the work. And that's what he did with the Israelites all of those years from Eden till his incarnation. And then he continues to do it in individual hearts within the church, the hearts of saints, the hearts of sinners, the hearts of you and I, down to this age. He's taking our brokenness and pulling us into the garden or into the desert to purify us. And then he plants a garden there, right? I have come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh and my spices. I eat my honey and sweetmeats. I drink my wine and milk. You know, it's not even just that God is doing this for us. We give him joy by trusting him by following him to the desert cross. We give him food. He can eat from the virtue of our lives, right? He can find rest on our breast, the way he found rest, you know, on the heart of Our Lady. Come, my lover, let us go to the fields and spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards and see if the vines are in bloom, if the buds have opened, if the pomegranates have blossomed. There I will give you my love. I came down to the nut garden to look at my fresh growth in the valley, to see if the vines were in bloom. Before I knew it, my heart had made me the blessed one of my kinswoman. Arise, my beloved, my beautiful one, and come. You know, in Genesis, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one body. The man and wife were both naked, yet felt no shame. And yet, that's what Christ does to us. You know, at Christmas, what did he do? He leaves his father in heaven. He comes to earth, to humanity, to become one flesh with us, right? Flesh of his flesh. And you know, he was infleshed, clothed with the flesh of our lady in the incarnation. But he becomes one with us, like I said, in the Eucharist. And what does he say in Isaiah 62? You shall be called my delight and your land espoused. For the Lord delights in you. He makes your land a spouse. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. It's just really beautiful to see the way that the Lord works. How he draws us into that desert, like John the Baptist said, a voice of one crying out in the desert so that he can make it bloom into a garden where we find that, that security and that rest with him, right? It fills our memory with Eden and what heaven will be. I wanted to share here too a quote from St. Jerome about the desert. He said, O oh, wilderness, bright with Christ's spring flowers. See, he saw the garden of God's love in the wilderness, in the desert. O oh, solitude, whence come those stones wherewith in the apocalypse the city of the mighty king is built? O oh, desert, rejoicing in God's familiar presence. What are you doing in the world, brother? 
you who are more than the universe. Believe me, I see something more of light than you behold. How sweet it is to fling off the burden of the flesh and to fly aloft to the clear radiance of the sky. That's the bright, he's talking about the desert being the bridal chamber, right? A furnace, St. Peter Damien always said that, you know, when you withdraw into solitude, it's like a furnace and a kiln and a workshop of spiritual effort. So we're, we're purified. But then it turns into Jacob's ladder where Jacob falls asleep. And what happens? He has a vision of angels going up and down from heaven. And he wakes up and he says, God was in this place, although I didn't know it. You know, look at the desert areas of your life. Maybe God's allowed those so that he can make it into a garden and unite with you. To make it your bridal chamber. Make it that nuptial chamber where you consummate your marriage with the Lord. Because our love is consummated with Jesus, especially on and through his flesh bleeding on the cross. The two were made one through his blood on the cross. And I want to touch here briefly on Our Lady of Guadalupe in light of this, like I said, because the messages and the words of Our Lady de Juan Diego are apropos for all of this, you know? You know, first, you just look at the topography and, and what's going on in Mexico at the time. And you have the Spaniards that are bringing the Catholic faith, but the Indians are being persecuted. And they're being told that everything about their natural way of life is wrong. And that wasn't true. They had some very beautiful, um, beautiful traditions that the Lord could build upon, right? And a good missionary doesn't just annihilate the culture of the people. They come and they show where God is among them, right? The God of the near and the far, the Indians worshiped. Well, Our Lady came to show them who that God of the near and the far was, right? Similar to the way St. Paul in the book of Acts, you know, goes and and finds that, that shrine to the unknown Roman God. And he says, you know, I know who this unknown God is. His name is Jesus and he's the only God and you should worship him, right? So Our Lady comes and like there's a desert situation going on in Mexico at the time because the Spaniards are really persecuting the Indians. But then the Indians are doing really bad things like child sacrifice and stuff. There's a lot of wounds in the people. And Our Lady comes dressed like an Indian. If you look at the symbolism on her dress, it's very um, naturalistic. It's very Indian. So it's her way of like embracing the people and coming to them in, in a familiar way. But she's pulling them. She's pregnant with the Christ, with Jesus Christ. And she's pulling them to her son. And she comes to Juan Diego. And what does she call him? Juanito, dearest Juan Dieguito. What is that? My littlest one, my littlest John, little Johnny, right? Look at the humility and the meekness of Our Lady. You know, there's nothing rich and luxurious about the way she's addressing or, or um, you know, full of, uh, of prestige in the way she's addressing Juan Diego. She's addressing him like a child. And when we are pulled into the desert in Advent, it's to become children in the hands of God, right? And she says, you know, listen, Juan, my dearest and youngest son, where are you going? Where are you going? What are you doing? She is interested in his path. God is interested in our path. And we've kind of strayed from him. So in Advent, he's pulling us back. He says the same thing to us. Where are you going? What are you doing? Come into the desert. Come away to a lonely place. I will lead you to the desert and speak to your heart. There the desert will turn into a lush garden. Our Lady says, no, no for sure my dearest, littlest, and youngest son. 
that I am the perfect and ever virgin Holy Mary, mother of the God of truth, through whom everything lives, the Lord of all things near us, the Lord of the heaven and the earth. So she's saying, like, I am related to this God that you don't know the name of, but that you worship, right? I want very much to have a little house built here for me in which I will show him. I will exalt him and make him manifest. You know, the Lord calls us into a desert to create a garden, a home, a place where he can meet us in love. And Our Lady comes to the desert of Mexico so a home can be built. A little house where she will give Jesus to us. She said, I will give him to the people in all my personal love, in my compassion, in my help, in my protection, because I am truly your merciful mother, yours and all the people who live united in this land and of all the other people of different ancestries, my little lovers who love me, those who seek me, those who trust in me. I will hear their weeping, their complaints, and heal all their sorrows and hardships and sufferings. So beautiful because her words echo God the Father's words to us in Isaiah, right? I will heal you. I will protect you. I will make all suffering beautiful. And Our Lady can say that to us because she's so united with Jesus. It's God doing it through her, right? So she's saying, bring me your desert problems. Bring me what needs to be purified. Bring me what's not right, and I'll make a desert garden there for you. I will bring you fruit and flowers to bear fruit in your suffering. What does she say? So I will hear their weeping, their complaints. I will heal their sorrows and hardships and sufferings. And to bring about what my compassionate and merciful concern is trying to achieve, you must go to the residence of the Bishop of Mexico and tell him that I've sent you here to show him how strongly I wish him to build me a temple here on the plain. You will report to him exactly all that you've seen, admired, and what you have heard. Know for sure, I will appreciate it very much. Be grateful and will reward you. And you, you will deserve very much the reward that I will give you for your fatigue, the work and the trouble that my mission causes you. Now go, my dearest son, you have heard my breath, my word. Go now and put forth your best effort. So like Our Lady perfectly received Jesus and all the graces he had for humanity. She received his desert heart and allowed him to make it a garden within her. And then she comes to us in the desert to make a garden in us, right? So what she receives from God, she gives to us, her children. You know, Pharaoh wouldn't believe that God wanted his people freed. So God had to send a sign. The Bishop of Mexico wasn't going to believe right away. But he was different from Pharaoh because once he got a sign, he did believe, right? And Our Lady had seen so many hardened hearts around her son those years that he dwelt on earth. And she would pray for their conversion, for their openness of heart, and her prayer worked. She says, I know how much fatigue and trouble my mission will cause you. How does she know? Because she knows the fatigue and the trouble that her son's mission caused her. But she wants to help us. And then just as she accepted the Father's will, what did she say? I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. That's what she tells Juan Diego to do. You've heard my word. Now go and put forth your best effort to fulfill it. She lived it first, but then she asks us to live it, and she tries to help us live it. And then what does she say later? Listen to me, my youngest and dearest son. Know for sure that I do not lack servants and messengers to whom I can give the task of carrying out my words. 
who will carry out my will. It is very necessary that you plead my cause and with your help and through your mediation that my will be fulfilled. My youngest and dearest son, I urge and firmly order you to go to the bishop again tomorrow. Tell him in my name and make him fully understand my intention that he start work on the chapel. I'm requesting, oh, that I'm requesting, tell him again that I am the ever virgin, Holy Mary, mother of God, who is sending you, right? She says, don't look at your weakness. Don't look at the parts of your life that make you think you're incapable of doing the will of God, of accepting his love, of becoming who he created you to be. Our Lady and Jesus can choose anyone, but he's chosen you, she's chosen you for one specific work that no one else can do. And so it's very important that you take this time in the desert to be purified and to prepare yourself so that Jesus can bear the fruit through you that he desires. What does she say? That is fine, my youngest and dearest son. You will return here tomorrow so that you may take the sign that the bishop asked for. Then he will believe and no longer doubt or be suspicious of you. And know, my dear son, I shall reward your care, work, and fatigue in my behalf. Now go tomorrow. I will be waiting here for you. She continues to, to demand that Juan Diego comes back, that he does his part of the work right? She's preparing the heart of the bishop by sending Juan Diego back over and over again. And finally, she says, okay, he's weak in faith. I'll give him a sign. And in all of this, she's like planting little seeds so that at one moment when she gives that sign, when those roses are given, when the image on her, the tilma appears, the hearts around are ready to receive it, right? And Juan Diego gets afraid because his uncle's dying. So he tries to avoid Our Lady and he kind of goes a back way and she meets him. She says, what is happening, dearest and youngest of my sons? Where are you going? Where are you headed? Listen and put it into your heart, my youngest and dearest son, that the thing that disturbs you, the thing that afflicts you is nothing. Do not let your countenance your heart be disturbed. Do not fear the sickness of your uncle or any other sickness for that matter. Do not fear anything sharp or hurtful. You know, do not fear the, the wild beasts in the desert. Do not fear the thorns on the cactuses. Do not fear your loneliness. Don't be intimidated by suffering. I remember a priest saying that to me once in confession, like 20 years ago. He said, Mary, your life's given to the cross. It was messy. Don't be intimidated by suffering. It's just suffering. And you know, it's like sometimes it happens where like you can get a migraine and like some people will be like, woe is me, I can't function. Like there's a better way to deal with it. You still might not be able to function, but don't let it like take all of your attention. You know, don't be intimidated by it. It's just a headache. It'll leave eventually. So you just got to endure it, right? You have to be careful not to be intimidated by the cross. And that's what she's saying. Don't let your countenance, your heart be disturbed. Do not fear the sickness of your uncle or any other sickness, nor anything that's sharp or hurtful. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and my protection? Am I not the source of your joy? Are you not in the hollow of my mantle and the crossing of my arm? Do you need anything else? Let nothing more worry you or disturb you. Do not let your uncle's illness worry you. He will not die now. You can be certain that he is already well. Have you ever been with people that you love so much that you forget to eat? You're just not thinking about it because you're so happy to just like be with them, right? Our lady is saying like, you are in my arms. Let my love be enough. And then you'll forget to be afraid. 
You'll forget to suffer in a way because the consolation of her love with us is so great. She says, go up, my dearest son, to the top of the hill to where you saw me and received my directions and you will find different kinds of flowers. Cut them, gather them, put them all together, and then come down here and bring them before me. She gives them instruction and he obeys. And then what at the end does she say? My youngest and dearest son, these different kinds of flowers, she says these different kinds were all a different kind of flower for the Lord. You know, he pulls us all into the same desert, but not to make us the same person. He creates a different garden out of each one of us. He has a different relationship with each one. Think about like when you have a big family with lots of brothers and sisters or nieces and nephews or children, you love each one fully, but you love them differently. They're different relationships. That's the way God is with us, right? And that's what Our Lady did. She gave different kinds of flowers as a sign, but they were all beautiful. They were all miraculous. This is the proof, the sign you will take to Bishop. You will tell him from me that he is to see in them my desire, and therefore he's to carry out my wish and my will. And you who are my messenger, in you I place my absolute trust. I strictly order you not to unfold your tilma or reveal its contents until you are in his presence. You will relate to him everything very carefully. Now I sent you to the top of the hill to cut and gather flowers. And all you saw and marveled at in, in order to convince the governing priest so that he will do what lies within his responsibility so that my house of God which I requested will be built. So she sends him to a place to get flowers that is unexpected, you know, go to the desert mountain in the middle of winter and cut these flowers. And God made it bear fruit as a sign of his love, as a place of his meeting. And what happened through those flowers? It wasn't just about the flowers, the flowers imprinted her miraculous image on the cloak, the tilma of Juan Diego. And in the same way, when the Lord draws us into the desert, especially this time of Advent, it's so that he can create it into a garden, so he can meet us there in love like he does with the Song of Songs, right? And that he can imprint his image, not just on our clothing, but on our hearts. What happened to Juan Diego with this image being imprinted upon him, right? God is doing in our hearts in that desert time. Have you ever seen a garden where they have like designs made out of the flowers? That's what he's doing. It's so beautiful, the work of the Lord in the interior life of the heart, of each person he loves. He draws them into the desert. He clears away everything. He prepares the ground. Then he plants flowers, but not just flowers, but flowers that leave his image. Living flowers of a meeting of love, an embrace of love with him. And it's not only just like a picture on our hearts, we turn into him. You know, a, a parent, a child takes on the characteristics of their parent. They talk like them, their expressions are like them. They look like them. That's what the Lord does. He, he takes us to a naked, empty place so there's nothing in the way. And then he impresses his love on us by making it a garden, by making it a place of meeting, of love. And he gives us not only the gift of his image on our mind and our heart, but he makes us into that living image. And then he does what the apostles did at the beginning, right? What we receive, then we're sent out. We're sent out then with this gift at Christmas. It doesn't end with our reception of Christ. Then we're sent out into the world that's very much like a, guard, like a desert. And the Lord says, okay, now I in you will make this desert place a garden. You know, here, clean off this heart here. 
blow the dust away, help them see reality, right? Give them a new perspective. Plant some flowers here. All he wants is for us to plant love, and then he decides if it bears fruit and how much fruit and where and why and how. And I really see that with my books and my, my ministry right now. I don't turn anyone away. It can be a homeless lady in Africa, or it can be, um, you know, an important person with a big ministry in California. If they're interested in something the Lord has given to me, I want to just throw that seed and then go on, right? And just hope that the Lord then cultivates it. But not to turn anyone away because my job is like he does in my life to do in other people's lives. To go into those desert places, to not fear to go into the desert places of people's lives, into the suffering of their lives. And to help clean it up and arrange it and to plant new life and to nurture that and to go on. The Lord always wants us to leave roses behind us. The same way that his mother gave roses to Juan Diego. He wants for us to do that for other people. And yeah, it's a miracle to do that. But he wants to do miracles through us. So that's all that I have this week. And I hope that by reflecting on that, the wilderness and the desert being turned into a garden and the great beauty of, of our meeting it with love with Christ there, that you'll be inspired at Christmas when he comes as that beautiful little baby to continue that journey that ends up on Calvary, back in the desert, that then he turns into a garden again through the resurrection. And that we then have the courage to go out into the world and to give that to other people. We pray with Our Lady for the grace to imitate her in this. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, our mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia and um, Merry Christmas here in a couple days. And next week, I will do the podcast I had wanted to do this week on baby Jesus and adoration and how the Lord asks us to live that worship and adoration of baby Jesus.